Well, uh, it's, it's been one of those glorious weeks, hasn't it? Have you, have you been uh, visiting to Aaron? You've, you've come, I, I think, on what might be summer. So enjoy it while you can. And it's been absolutely glorious. And as usual, you know, I've been out and about doing all the things that I usually get up to. Um, but this island is one of those places where you turn a corner. And it may be the same corner that you've turned for the last 30 years, but it's a special shade of glory this morning. It's a special shade of beauty. Whether it's sunshine or whether there's a bit of drizzly rain, not that we get much of that, but in every place you go, it's, it's beautiful and it's glorious. And you know something? We all have that um, tendency to get attached to the things that we see and that we know and that we find familiar. And especially those things which we find to be especially beautiful. I mean, we do. We, we are, we are at the moment earthbound creatures and all that we see around us is, is all that we can really fathom. But something different is coming and it is more glorious. Can you imagine that? Something more glorious than the Isle of Arran on a beautiful sunshiny day. There's something coming which is even more glorious. Think of the people that you've met this week. I don't know if you've often chance to do this, but one of my favourite things to do is people watch. Anyway, any people watchers in the room? Yeah, it's a glorious thing to do. Uh, and uh, every opportunity I can, I love to sort of secrete myself in a little corner somewhere and just watch the glorious people walking past. It's a wonderful thing. And yet, look at us, we're all falling to bits. You know, we're, we're, we're decaying. Anyone decaying this morning? Yeah. You know, we're, we're, we are, there's, a, there's a lovely song that I sing with my friends in the Sacred Harp, which is all about facing your death with tremendous victory. And it says, We are passing away. We are passing away. We are passing away to that great judgment day. And as people sing, sing in a little square and sing about the fact that we're passing away because there is something more glorious coming for you. I, I was expecting a little bit of a, I mean, you, you'll come to know by now, expect a few hallelujahs or a few amens at least. You know, there's something glorious coming. And as someone who was awake most of the last night with pains in my feet, I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to that. But in the same way that we get attached to the physicalities around us, so we get attached to the physicality of our lives. We cling on to our lives with everything that we have, don't we? We fight for it. We go for it. We cling on to this. Because we are locked in our physical situation. And life is a precious thing. And boy, we want to enjoy it. And we want to enjoy God and everything that it means. But there is something more glorious coming. We need to hear that for ourselves today. Why? Because as I mentioned just slightly last week, death is at the door. There's a little phrase that says, the wood for your coffin is currently growing in the field. How's that for a Sunday morning? (laughs) The wood for your coffin is currently growing in the field. And some of you are thinking that tree's already been cut down and is waiting. And it's true. And it's true. And you see, it's only a ridiculously optimistic and trusting faith in Jesus Christ that enables any of us to sit in the presence of death and say, where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting on one hand? Because how many of you know in this life the pain and the sting of death, when it comes to your household, to your loved ones, and to your family, and you feel 
the sting. You're aware of its presence. You know it's there and it lurks. And so when Jesus Christ comes and walks the earth and goes to Calvary and goes to the tomb and is raised on the third day, we look at him and we see in the midst of our death the most glorious hope. And this is what Paul has been getting at. He's been talking about how important this resurrection theory, this theology, this reality is in our day-to-day experience. And so that's where he's been going. But he wants to take it a step further because he must have been encountering in the midst of the church at Corinth all sorts of weird ideas. How do we know that? Because, well, he's been talking to all the weird ideas that they had started to gather for themselves about resurrection. Some of them had started to believe that resurrection wasn't even going to be a thing. And he's obviously picked up on the fact that there's some people who think that this resurrection thing it is just going to be some sort of thing that happens and then after death we start to just float around like weird things on clouds, maybe plucking hearts. I don't know what exactly their thoughts were, but they were starting to lose the full essence of what Paul had been teaching in the church up until this point, teaching everywhere. We, we won't be floaty, disembodied harp strumming cloud sitting cherubs when we pass on for this life paul is saying there is coming to us a physical resurrection our bodies will be raised what is coming and what is coming new is tangible not ethereal and floaty and esoteric but tangible. And and Paul then talks about some contrasts to try and help us get in our minds what is coming. He talks about the contrast between perishable and imperishable. When was the last time you found an unfortunate banana sitting at the bottom of the bowl? You, you, You have a vision of perishable, you know, as over and against the bowl, which in comparison to the perishable banana seems imperishable. And so Paul starts to pick up these, these ideas to give us the contrast. That this, this life which is perishable, we're fading away, will be transformed into something eternal and imperishable. He then picks up again his previous argument and he contrasts Adam as the earthly man. Do you remember the story in Genesis where Adam is created from the dust? The dust is created and formed and the breath of God breathes into Adam and so he comes to life. A picture there of the first Adam, of this life, of this existence. But then the contrast with Jesus Christ who walks out of the grave in a new body and more than that, who ascends heaven in this new and first creation, these first fruits. There's Adam, the earthly stuff, and then there's the glorious thing that God is doing in physical resurrection. He then talks about, again, picking up on that Adam-Christ conversation, the idea of an earthly man and a heavenly man. And so he starts to build rock upon rock, statue upon statue, this contrast. And who is he speaking to? He's speaking to people like you and me who are having to live in physical bodies and who maybe understandably are starting to lose a sense of what God is going to do. But he's saying it is going to be transformed. And in verse 49, 49, he says, and we, and we will be like him. We will be like him as this new heavenly man, woman being. What he has brought into being has been brought into being for us. It will be glorified. It will be amazing. It will be nothing that you've ever imagined. I don't, know if you, I don't know if this encourages you or not. I mean, does it? Does it encourage you? You know, this is what is coming to us, Gordon. It's coming to us. And Christ has done it. 
And, and this, this faith in Jesus Christ, this trust that what he has done is good, is the gate through which we inher- enter into this inheritance. As for him, so for us. So we will receive not just a place where we can float about in some disembodied existence, but we will receive a new physical body, but to do what and to be where? You might remember at the beginning of our time, I opened with those verses from Revelation chapter 21, because God is going to go the extra mile because he's not just in the business of resurrecting our physical bodies and transforming them into a new heavenly being, but that new heavenly being is going to have a new place to be on the new heaven and the new earth. This is the culmination of God's plan. Now, I think that in the church of Jesus Christ, Today, we sometimes get a, an unfull, if that's a word, picture of, of what we, where we think this is all going. I don't know what you think of when you think of going to heaven. But the reality is that that idea of going to heaven is not the full biblical picture. Because we're told that what God has in mind is a new heaven and a new earth and our dwelling place will be there. And we will be with God and he'll be among us. And we don't know exactly what it's going to be like. But what we do know is that there's going to be a glorious thing that God is going to do. And as part of this new heaven and the new earth, again, there are going to be some notable, notable absences. There will be no more death. There will be no more mourning or crying or pain, because the old order of things has passed away. And then it comes to the thing where I think, I don't know if I agree with you, God, because it says earlier on in the chapter, there will be no more sea. Oh, oh. These are, these are symbols. And what does that mean? I mean, the, the, the sea in Revelation in particular, the sea is the place where all the evil resides, where everything is evil and everything is bad and everything is ugly. It comes up out of the depths of the sea. And so when John receives this revelation and it says there's no more sea, it, it really means that absolutely every ugly, evil thing is absolutely no more. And so this physical resurrected body for those of us who are in Christ will inhabit this perfect, new, glorious creation that God is going to usher in. And at the moment, those who have died in Christ, they enter into a sleep in the presence of the Lord because we will all inherit this new land together. We'll all experience this together. Think what Paul says to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15 to 17. I read this a few weeks ago, but I'm going to read it again today. He says, according to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, the dead of Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with him forever. It's good news. We're waiting for this glorious resurrection. And so those who sleep and who sleep in death are held in the hands of the God who loves them and gave his life for them. Every human being awaits that final coming for that judgment, for that righteous judgment of God. And then we become inheritors of everything that we've sown in this life. And if we have faith in Christ, so we enter that new heaven and new earth with our new glorified bodies in his new heaven and earth. And then we have that picture, the new Jerusalem, this ultimate picture of Jesus Christ coming and being united with his bride, the church. Everything in us which is perishable, 
finally united and consummated in that thing which is eternal forever and ever. The full redemption of absolutely everything. He will make all things new and we will be there. We are the bride being made ready. Even with our imperishable, our perishable stuff in Christ, it becomes the thing that is joined to him and we will be with him forever. You know, every time you look in the New Testament and Paul is talking about this eternal stuff, he, he's always telling it in a particular context and it's for our encouragement. I always think it's a great shame uh, that the book of Revelation in particular often ends up being that book that we're scared to read uh, because we don't know what it all means. <laughs> but it's one of those books which is the most uh, hopeful of all because it tells us the very end game, the very end story. And every place in the scripture where Paul talks about the return of Christ, about the transformation of every single person who's in Christ, it's always in the context of this. I tell you this so that you can stand firm. I tell you this so that you can be of good courage. I tell you this because really this is where your hope is. Because whoever of us was ever promised an easy life? I mean, is there anyone out there with an easy life? I would like to come and meet you and find out what that feels like. We will face all kinds of stuff. We will face all kinds of stuff. And don't you know it? We'll face it in our bodies as we reap the harvest of decay and death. We face it in our minds as the things of the world, inside us and outside us, tempt us, and in a sense sometimes even terrorize us. We'll face it from out with us in the communities in which we live, like many of our brothers and sisters here. I mean, the folk that were receiving this letter of revelation were in the very midst of one of the most trying periods for the people of God that they'd ever seen for such a long time. We need to have these glorious pictures of our hope ever before our eyes, lest we sink and take our eyes off of Jesus. We see it so many times in the scripture. Remember that night when the disciples were on the boat and Jesus decides he's gonna be weird for a few moments. He sends them out into the storm. The storm rages up. And then he sees, he sees, they see this Jesus coming towards them, walking on, what? Walking on the water? If we had that gift, we wouldn't need a ferry. That would be fa quite fantastic. The long Jesus, a long Jesus comes. And you get that interplay then. Peter sort of looking and saying, after the terror. I mean, you'd get the terror, wouldn't you? You'd get, you'd get the, oh, what's going on here? He's in that moment where he says, well, Jesus, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. And we get this incredible picture of, of Peter stepping out of the boat. Can you, can you imagine it? Can you imagine being on a boat? I mean, you, you can't imagine it. Because you, you know immediately what's going to happen. You're going to sink. And some of us are going to sink faster than others. <laughs> and, but Peter gets himself and, he, and he, he steps. Can you imagine that first step? Onto wave. <laughs> and he takes the next step and he begins to move towards Jesus until the, the strife around him. He takes his eyes off of Jesus and he begins to sink again. Friends, we are not standing on a lake moving towards Jesus. We are standing in the midst of life and we are moving towards eternity. And the invitation that we have is that in spite of the uncertainty of everything that is around us, we step out in the certainty that Jesus has a hope for us, that it is kept in heaven for us. And we step out in this life, in that sure and certain hope, with our eyes fixed on Jesus, knowing that there will come a day when the rot 
will end when everything is renewed and we will be with him and we will be like him and we will enjoy eternity in his glorious new kingdom. Friends, I want to encourage you with this as you step out from this place this morning to go keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus because he is your only hope. He is our only hope in life and in death and in everything beyond death. And I hope to see you there. Let's pray together.